we know, we know the purpose of flow control is to make sure our sender doesn't send too fast for the receiver, for both stop and wait, and for sliding window. Okay, so both of them, that's their aim. Make sure we don't send too fast. Because the receiver, if it has limited space to store what it receives, if we send too much before it processes the data it receives, it will lose some data. And we saw stop and wait is very simple, where we just send one data frame, and the receiver tells us when it's ready to receive the next one by sending back an act frame, an acknowledgement, saying, OK, I've received your data, I've processed it, I'm now ready for a new frame. So it sends back an act to say that, an acknowledgement. But stop and wait can be inefficient in some cases because what happens is we send one data frame. If the propagation delay is, is large, then the source spends a lot of time waiting for an act to come back. Time spent waiting, time spent not sending across the link. So that's inefficient because we want to send as much data as possible across the link. We want to use it all the time. So sliding window flow control is a variation, or in fact a, a, a superset, where we allow to send multiple frames before waiting for an act. So very similar. Instead of sending one frame, wait for an act, send a window of frames and then wait for an act, where this, the size of the window may vary. Still, the aim is to do flow control. Don't send too much to overflow the receiver, where too much is defined by the size of the window. So the window, or at least the maximum window, is an indicator of how much the receiver can receive. Sliding window is more complex than stop and wait because we need to now keep track of which frames have we sent. It's not just one frame, one, one data, one act. We may send a set of frames and receive multiple acts now. So we use sequence numbers in, the, in each frame to keep track of the ordering of those frames, frame one, frame two, frame three. We and both the sender and receiver keep track of the sender keeps track of what it has sent and what has been acknowledged. Okay, that's this set of frames. So at some point in time, I have sent some frames and I've received the act back. That done. And I may have sent some frames, like six and seven, but I'm waiting on the act. So I just sent those two frames. They're out on the link. Maybe the act's coming back. I haven't received it yet. And because we're allowed to send multiple frames, the window indicates how many more I'm allowed to send. I haven't sent them yet, but I'm allowed to because the window uh, allows us to send up to some maximum number of frames, the maximum window size. And all the frames beyond that, I'm not allowed to send. So we keep track of those four t sets of frames. Those that are done, those that have been sent but not act, those that I'm allowed to send, and those that I'm not allowed to send. And the way that we can keep track of that is to store three variables at the source. These three variables. The variables really are some indicator of the split between these four sets of frames. It is this point, this point, and here. So commonly we can think the last frame transmitted tells us the split between here, the last, sorry, the last frame acknowledged here, the last frame transmitted, frame seven, and the size of the window tells us where the split is here. So by storing values for those three variables, the sender keeps track of what's happened in terms of sending data and receiving acts. Receiver does effectively the same thing, but from the perspective of receiving data and sending back acts. And this is under the assumption that the receiver has enough memory, enough buffer space to store W frames, where W is the maximum window size. If our maximum window is seven, then we assume the receiver has enough memory to store seven frames at a time. In stop and wait, the receiver needs enough memory to store just one frame at a time, the one it receives. 
So in sliding window, we need more memory at the receiver, which is a, a, a limitation of the protocol. It, it's a drawback. Uh, what else? Again, we send data, receiver sends back acts, sometimes called a receive ready message. We'll see that there's a variation or a modification of the act, but I, either an acknowledgement or a receive ready. Again, the, the meaning is the receiver is ready to receive more data. And we went through an example showing how the perspective from A and B, the source and destination, change for those three variables, the, the last frame act transmitted and the window size. But graphically we see how as we send frames, our window closes. Our window is the blue box. We send three frames, means we're allowed to send four more. As we receive acknowledgements, saying that the receiver is ready to receive more, our window opens, allowing us to send more. Send frames, the window closes, it gets smaller, we can send just three now. Receive an ACK, we can send one more because of the acknowledgement. And we see this concept of a window sliding along and opening and closing as we send data and receive ACKs. And similar at the destination. What we, what we <coughs> eventually go through today is, well, how, how does this help with efficiency? How does this overcome the limitations of stop and wait? We'll see that today. But first, a few more details about uh, the acknowledgements, the receive ready. This, just be careful, this is one specific example. It doesn't always operate like this. In this example, the source sent three frames at the start. Why three? Well, just for this example, let's say it only has enough data to make up three frames. It's allowed to send seven at the start, but it only sends three. Why? Well, one reason, because it only has enough data to send at this point in time to make up three frames. Okay, so just in this example. In another example, if the source had a lot of data to send, maybe it would send 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Send all seven frames at the start. So just in this example. Later, it sends four frames, one after another. So the window indicates what you're allowed to send. Of course, what you actually send must be less than or equal to the window but it depends upon how much data you have at that time. The other thing is, what about the acknowledgements? When do we send an ACK or a receive ready message? In this example, B received three frames and then sent one acknowledgement, which is a bit different or strange from what we've seen in the past, at least with stop and wait. Stop and wait, one data, one ACK. Here, three data frames received, one act comes back. It doesn't have to happen like this. Just in this example, it could have been receive the first frame, send back an act. Receive the second, send back an act. The third, another act. It could have been like that. Sliding window doesn't, deter doesn't say which way it should be. It depends upon how someone implements it. Okay, so some products may do one act for every frame. Some may wait until they've received a set of frames and then send a single act, like in this case. What's the difference? Which one's better? Send one act for every frame, or as in this example, receive three and send one act. What's the advantage of, say, this one, compared to sending one act for every frame? lower overhead. Now, if we think of the, the link going from B to A, here, receive three frames, send one ACK. If we had the alternative, send an ACK for each frame, we'd send three ACKs. 
So across this link, there's the option of sending a single ACK or sending three, three acknowledgements. These ACKs don't contain data. They are overhead. They, are re they reduce the efficiency of the usage of that link because the more time we spend sending acknowledgements, the less time we have available to send data, say, from B to A. This just shows data from A to B, but at the same time, B may want to send data to A. So the, the fewer acts we send, the better. Okay, so that's why, in this case, it's, it's, it could be better to send a single act than three acts. Now, sending one act for three is a little bit more complicated because we need to determine, well, when do we send this act? Do we send it after the third frame? But what if we just receive two frames and a third one doesn't arrive? So it becomes complicated when we want to determine the best way for responding with an ACK. But just be aware that there are different variations of a, uh, possible. Now how does it work, this ACK? And it's common in many protocols, not just this one, that an acknowledgement includes a number where that number indicates the next sequence number expected. So B received 0, 1, and 2. It sends back a receive ready, an ACK, saying, I now expect 3. It doesn't say, it doesn't send back an ACK number saying, I've just received 0, 1, and 2. Or I've just received 0, I've just received 1, I've just received 2. It says, what's the next value expected? And it has the same effect. Uh, but it's easier because if we receive an act saying I expect 3, that implies everything before 3 that has been sent has been received and acknowledged. Because we do things in order, if I send 0, 1 and 2, A has sent 0, 1 and 2, and it receives an act saying B expects 3, then that must mean that B received 0, 1, and 2. Because if they hadn't received 0, 1, and 2, if they hadn't received 2, for example, but just 0 and 1, they wouldn't send back receive ready 3, they would have sent back receive ready 2. Okay. So this is a common way to, to acknowledge data. Tell the source what's the next number you expect. Okay, so that's the basics of sliding window. Um, let's now move on towards the efficiency. Why can sliding window be more efficient than stop and wait? Why is it more efficient, or why can it be more efficient? Send more data in in what time? In send more data. So be more specific. You're on the right track. Send you get to send more data potentially in the time it takes for an act to come back. Okay. With stop and wait, you send one data, and you must wait for that one act to come back. With sliding window, you can send a window size of data before you have to wait for an act to come back. So you, you have the potential to send more data before waiting for the act to return. In other words, you can spend more time sending data as opposed to waiting for the act, which is more efficient. Uh, This is a joint class, ITCS section, so there's many seats down the front. You're welcome to sit down here.
Last week when we introduced stop, stop and Wait, we had some example where someone came out the front and I sent them data and overflowed them. And then we used Stop and Wait and uh, saw that with Stop and Wait, we, we control the flow of data at the receiver and it uh, avoids the overflow. Let's have an example of sliding window. And we need some volunteers. OK, the people who just come in late. Good. Uh, I'm going to be the sender. You're the receiver. Just stand up. Uh, stay where you are, though. I'm going to send my data to you. I'm going to send data to the to the destination, and they're going to send back acknowledgments. These are our acknowledgments. Okay, we'll use these as acts this time. And they have numbers on them. And you just arrived late, but remember the key point when you receive data, you're going to send back an ACK for every data frame you receive, and the number of the ACK will be one more than the data you receive. If you receive zero, send back a number one. If you receive two, send back a number three. Easy. Okay, I'll hold on to them. You'll need them all. Well, so he's got ACKs that is going to come back to me. Now, the, the benefit of sliding window arrives when the propagation delay is much larger than the transmission delay. So we need a large link. All right. You're on the link. Stand up. Just stay where you are, but stand up and get ready. We need to form a link back to our destination. Okay. Just stay where you are. Yep. Stand up and stand up. You're our link. Because I cannot reach the destination. I've got my data, and what I'm going to do quite simply is send the data. So I, I'm the transmitter, I send the data, and these six people in the middle are our link. And what they're going to do is receive the data, just pass it at normal speed to the next person. It'll be received by the destination. When the destination receives the data, they'll see the sequence number and send back an ACK. Okay? Any questions on what you're going to do? We have six link, well, six people forming the link and one destination. Everyone else will watch and observe. And these are my data packets, okay? We have a sequence number on there. In fact, we don't need a sequence number because in the first case, I'm going to use stop and wait. I have a lot of data to send, okay? But let's use stop and wait. So I can send the data quite quickly to the first onto the link. And let's try. I've got more data to send. I want to send it. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Here I am as the source and I have nothing to do. Until I receive the act saying, thank you, the next number I expect is one. In fact, we don't need sequence numbers in stop and wait. And then I would send the next data frame. And I'm not going to do it because you know how stop and wait works and it takes a long time. Because what happened there is that I sent the data and I spent a lot of time waiting for the act to come back. Very inefficient for me because I spent a lot of time doing nothing. Short time to transmit, a long time to just send the act back what we need. A long time waiting. So now let's try sliding window. Okay? And to keep it simple, we'll have a window of three. So let's say a two-bit sequence number. So we're going to use sequence numbers 0, 1, 2, 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. In fact, we won't go far. Um, and the source would keep track of uh, the data that it's sent and the current window size. So what's my initial window size at the start? 
three. Okay, it means I can <coughs> send three frames. And let's do this slowly. So frame number zero, I send. And frame number one, keeps. you're the link. And frame number two. And now I know I've sent three. I haven't received an, an act yet. My window is now zero. I cannot send any more. So I'm waiting for an act to come back. And in fact, I'll eventually receive three acts. It'll get a bit complicated at the receiver. It's a long processing time at the receiver. It's a slow computer back there. Actually, there'll be one act coming at a time, one following in the other. And as you put the act in there, when I receive one act, I can send one more data. We have an error in the link here. <laughs> and I receive the next act. It's a full duplex link. They can go both in the same directions. And this is a, a zero. Sorry, I don't have the number on it. And I receive the third act. And I will send whatever the next number one. Every time I received an act in that case, I could send one more frame. Just pause, just stop for a moment. Okay, well, let's pause our link. But what, what happened there, the main point is that at the start I sent three frames. So I delivered three frames to the destination, then I had to wait for the act to come back. So with stop and wait, for the time to get the data there and get an act back, I delivered one, one frame. With sliding window, the time to get the data there and get an act back, I delivered three frames. So three times more efficient, because I've delivered three times more data to the destination in the same amount of time. Because with this same length link, to get the data there and to get the act back, it's the same time, whether we're using stop and wait or sliding window. How many frames? What's the window size I need to be <coughs> maximum efficiency? Note with the sliding window there of three frames, I sent three and I still spent some time waiting. Slow processor, long link. I still had to wait for the act to come back. So I sent and then waited a long time. How could I increase the efficiency? How can I ensure that I wait zero time? First one, increase the window size. So in the f I sent three frames, my window was three. If I had a window of seven, I would send seven frames. I'm not going to try, it will become too hard. If I send seven frames, then I spend most of my time transmitting. What if I sent 100 frames, a window of 100? And I think if we did it, we'd see that I'd be sending the 10th, the 11th frame, the 20th frame, and so on. While I'm sending those frames, eventually the act would come back for the first frame. So I'd send the first one, and then, then all the others, and eventually the data would arrive, the act would come back. When the act comes back, I'm still sending the window. And remember, whenever I receive an act, I can send another frame. And if we have a window large enough, it will turn out that I'm always sending, never waiting. And that's the best case we can achieve, the best case efficiency. And you need to be able to calculate that. So let's thank the, our link and our receiver, and uh, let's try and calculate the efficiency. Did you consume? the data. <laughs> so the, the, the advantage of sliding window can be that we spend little time waiting for the act to come back, especially when we have a large propagation delay. The example, and I think it's in your lecture notes, I hope, very much it's in your lecture notes. Did I print it out? 
if you just go to the end of this <laughs> uh, to the end of this lecture yeah at, at the end of this lecture there's a a two pictures of sliding window which we'll use as an example I'll show them on the screen Uh, the file is, I think, a sliding window example on the website. Let's see if I find it first. This one. So it's the e at the end of this lecture, in your lecture notes, there's a separate file on the website if you want to see. This is an example... <coughs> we'll use to illustrate how the efficiency of sliding window can be determined. Let's make sure you can hear. I don't. Uh, so make sure you can see this one. I have color. You can uh, only black and white, but you can make sense of it. I've, I'll show t two cases here, and we'll look at the timing for sending our data using sliding window and then we can go through some examples of calculating. To, to speed this one up I've done some calculations in advance so let's make it so the for this example I've set the propagation delay to be 200 time units whether it's 200 microseconds, 200 seconds, 200 milliseconds, I haven't specified, okay, but 200 of something. Uh, just to keep things simple, I've omitted the units. Uh, the units are not given. But let's say we have a link such that the propagation delay is 200. And we have a data frame which takes some time to transmit. And in this case, we say that the total time to transmit the data is 100 time units which consists of 90 of 90% 90 of that is the real data 10% is header so just to keep things simple I haven't given the actual data size in bytes but just the data transmission time which you would calculate normally and the ACK takes 10 time units to transmit we have a two-bit sequence number so inside the header of each data frame, this, and inside the ACK in some cases, uh, in, also inside the ACK, we include a two-bit sequence number. Two bits, of course, value zero up to three in decimal. We include them in there. And with a two-bit sequence number, the maximum window size we have available is three. So on one of the slides, the general formula is the maximum window is 2 to the k minus 1. K, k is 2 in our case, so the maximum window is 3. Meaning we're allowed to send 3 frames, and then we have to wait for an act to come back. So what this diagram does is draws the sequence of frames that you've done before with stop and wait in, in this part. But I also, on the left, keep track of the, the window from the perspective just of the source. I haven't drawn it for the destination B. We'd also, in reality, that B would keep track of this information as well. But just to keep it simple, let's focus on the source A. And I've tried to color code it, and you'll see at least the, the shading in your printout Remember we have four types of, or four sets of frames. From the source, we have the frames which uh, have already been transmitted. And let's go back to the lecture notes to see that. We have, to the left, the frames which are already transmitted. They're done, finished. We have here the frames which are outstanding. That is, we've sent them, we're waiting for an act to come back. Then we have the window, which are the frames we're allowed to send, and the rest are frames which are not allowed. So four sets of frames. 
and I've colour-coded them here, although I haven't drawn to the left. <clears throat> the grey ones we'll see eventually are those which are finished, completed. Those which I've sent and received an act for. The green ones are the window, those that I'm allowed to send. The red ones are those that have been transmitted but not yet act. And the ones to the right, the white ones, I'm not allowed to transmit yet. And this is all determined by the windowing mechanism at the source. With a maximum window size of three, initially, we haven't sent anything, our window is three. If we start at frame zero, we're allowed to send frame zero, one and two. So at time zero, when we start this, we're allowed to send three frames. This assumes we always have data ready to send. And we're also going to assume eventually that the destination B always sends one ACK for one data frame received. So at the start, we're allowed to send three frames. Let's start sending them. So we can only transmit one at a time. So we start transmitting frame zero. We're transmitting. As soon as frame zero is transmitted out of the source A, it starts transmitting frame one. And then frame two. And after transmitting frame zero, we'll see that the window will change such that zero becomes a frame which has been transmitted but not yet act, while the window covers one and two. The window size is two. The window size is the number of frames we're allowed to send. It covers those two frames, frame number one and frame number two. That's after sending frame zero. And then after sending frame one, zero and one are transmitted, red. Two is allowed to be sent. So then we start sending two. And eventually, zero, one, and two are those that have been transmitted. But we haven't yet received an ACK. And the timing will be such that because each data frame takes 100, to transmit three in a row will take 300 time units. So we go from 0 to 300 here. Of course, those frames propagate across to B. We transmit them, and they propagate across the link and are received at the destination. And it takes three, sorry, 200 time units to propagate, which means frame 0, we started transmitting at 0, finished at time 100. It will be completely received by B at time 300. 100 plus the propagation of 200 brings us to 300. So B receives frame 0 at time 300. In this example, we're going to assume that as soon as B receives the frame, it immediately processes that frame and sends back an ACK. And that's receive the frame. There's no waiting here. There's no processing time. Let's say it's very, very small. Immediately send back an ACK. The ACK takes 10 time units to transmit, so we'd finish transmitting at time 310. And the ACK needs to propagate back. And it will arrive at time 510. So that's the ACK for the first frame, frame with sequence number 0. So from the perspective of the source, we're allowed to send three frames, so we transmit th those three frames. After transmitting those three frames, we've sent our window size. We're limited now. We cannot send any more. This is the flow control mechanism. That is, we're not allowed to send too many to overflow the receiver. In this example, too many is more than three. Okay, we're limited to sending just three at a time. So we send the three, and now at time 300, we're waiting. This is the, the time which is inefficient. We're waiting. We're not sending anything. We're waiting for the ACK to come back. We're waiting. And then at time 510, we receive an ACK. And the reception of an ACK, and in this case, what would the ACK number be? In the, in the acknowledgement, or on the other slides, it was called the receive ready, there was a number. The acknowledgement number or the receive ready number. What would the value be in this what first act that comes back? 
be careful. If we, this frame is zero, the act is just for this frame zero. Okay? It's different from the previous example where we sent three frames and got one act. Here, for every frame received, B is going to send back an act. So for frame zero received, B sends back an act and the number in this act would be one because the acts indicate the next value expected. Not the current one received, the next one expected. So it says, thank you for that data, I now expect frame number one. And all right, we'll come back to here at the moment because in the meantime, frame one arrives at B at time 400, is that right? Yeah, 400. Frame one, finish transmitting at 200, propagation of 200, transmit the ACK. This is the ACK for frame one. It takes 10 to transmit. We finish transmitting at time 410 and we send the ACK back. And the ACK number is two because this ACK acknowledges frame number one by saying the next one I expect is two. And you'll see at time 500 the second frame will be fully received and the act would come back. We'll look at the act coming back in a moment. Uh, the <coughs> okay, the act comes back, the first act. Act number one. It acknowledges, well, let's look at A. A has sent zero, one, and two, has not yet received an act for any of them. Then it receives an act saying the next number expected is one, which effectively means frame number zero has been acknowledged. It's been successfully received, and the receiver has said, thank you, let's move on. So from the Windows perspective, when we receive this ACK, frame zero becomes one of those which has been sent and ACKed. Frames one and two are still outstanding. That is, we've sent them, we're still waiting for an ACK at this point in time. We haven't yet received the ACK. Because we receive the ACK for one frame, our window grows. The green part is our window, it grows so that we're allowed to send one more frame. Every time a frame is act, we can send another frame. So three is allowed to be sent now. And at the same instant, once we know that three is allowed to be sent, because we have enough data, we transmit frame three. So we start transmitting frame three. And once frame three is transmitted, then we would change to the state where zero is done 1, 2, and 3 are outstanding. Outstanding in terms of we've sent them, but we're waiting for an act still. Any questions before we scroll down? So we're going through another example of sliding window, and we're going to arrive at a calculation for the efficiency and compare it under different conditions. Let's keep going. So at time 510, we receive an ACK, allowing us to send one more frame, so we send that frame, which means we're not allowed to send any more until we receive another ACK. We're sent frame three. Note that this link is full duplex. What that means is that A can be transmitting frames and receiving acts at the same time. And I haven't said that before, but we assume that we can be sending and receiving at the same time. So we're transmitting frame three, and while we're transmitting that, it's behind here, uh, at time 610, because act two was sent here, it eventually arrives at this time, we receive the second act. 
And the first act had act number one. The second one would have act number two here. We receive that act, meaning with act number two, frame one is done. Because as you can see, this act acknowledges frame sequence number one. So frame one is done, meaning we're allowed to send one more frame. So we transmit that frame, frame zero, and now two, three, and zero are outstanding. We're waiting for the acts for those three. And then eventually the third act arrives, acknowledging frame two. Frame two is completed. We're allowed to send one more. We start sending frame one, and when that's done, three, zero, and one are outstanding. Our window is closed. We're not allowed to send any more because we've got three frames outstanding and the maximum window is three. So because our window is closed, we're not allowed to send any more frames, we now have to wait again, wait for an act to come back. <clears throat> and frame three was transmitted. It propagates to the other side. B sends back an ACK. That ACK's going to arrive at 10,020. And you can calculate that at times 610 plus 2. 200 for propagation, plus 10 for the ACK, plus another 200 to get back. What's the ACK number of this one? What's the ACK number of the fourth ACK received? Try and write it or, or work it out, the ACK number for all of those ACKs. You can write it on your slides, on your picture. If you scroll forward. This picture is in your lecture notes. It's on the front page, but it's also the end of uh, the topic on flow control and error control. Write the act numbers. So when the acts come back, indicate the number of that, that acknowledgement. What are these act numbers? If you scroll through, you'll find it inside the lecture notes as well, that picture. Remember the acknowledgement numbers is not shown on this diagram. These are the acts, the acknowledgements. The numbers included in those acts indicate the next number, the next sequence number of data expected. So the first sequence number received was one, uh, sorry, was zero. So the act number here would be one. If we receive zero, the next number expected is one should be in order. Then we receive one. The next act here would be two. We receive two. The next act number would be three. We receive three. The next act number is zero. It's zero. Remember, with our sequence numbers, we're limited to zero, one, two, three. Zero, one, two, three. We only have two bits available. There's no four. We wrap around. So, when we receive frame with sequence number three, we send back an act saying, thank you, I now expect frame with sequence number zero, because that's the next one in this sequence. So this would be zero, one, and two. And in fact, I think we reached the end that we receive an act with act number zero saying, Frame three is done. I'm allowed to send one more. 
I ascend that one. I've got three outstanding, 0, 1 and 2. Then I receive another ACK. And that allows me to send one more frame. And then I'll receive another ACK, and it's not shown here. I, I stopped the diagram, but it keeps going. I'd be able to send another data frame. And then if you follow that, we'd have to wait, because we'd have three frames outstanding. And we'd have to wait for the next ACK to come back. Can you see the pattern in this case? If we, if we continue drawing this, if I ask you in the exam, here's the scenario, we have 1,000 frames. Of course, you're not going to draw the entire set of 1,000 data frames because you should quickly see that it's just repeating. Window was three. We're allowed to send three frames, and then we have to wait for the act to come back. And the first act arrives back, allowed to send one more. But then the second act comes back, so allows to send one more. The third act comes back, allowed to send one more. We've sent three, now we have to wait again, because three is the maximum we can send before waiting for an act. So we wait, we wait, receive an act. One, two, three sent again. Wait, three sent. And if you keep going, we'll see that this pattern of Transmit three data frames, wait for the ACK for the first one to come back, and then transmit another three frames, wait for the ACK for the first one to come back, and so on. It just repeats. Any questions on, on this procedure with our sliding window flow control? In the case where we have always have data to send, so we've always got something to send, and we're always sending one ACK for one data frame received, with zero processing delay to keep our calculations simple. So we care about the performance when we use this protocol. Given this link, how efficient are we in using this link? Well, we see Every 510 time units, 0 to 510, 510 to 1020, so again another 510 time units, every 510 time units we're sending three data frames. Therefore B is receiving three data frames. So what fraction of the time are we receiving real data? And it's down the bottom of the slide, but let's make note. I won't write units, just to, to keep it simple. We receive three data frames every 510 time units. Now, each data frame, if we go back to the top, each data frame, the data transmission time of 100 consists of 90 time units of sending real data and 10 of sending the header. So 90% of the time when we're sending a data frame, we're sending real data. So in every 510 time units, how long are we sending, for, or for what time are we sending real data? Three data frames, each we transmit real data for 90 time units, every 510 time units. 270 over 510. That is, we're sending real data, and therefore receiving real data, every, for 270 time units, every 510 time units. The other 240 time units, we're either sending header or we're waiting. Or there's acts, so waiting from the source's perspective. So that's our measure of efficiency. 
Efficiency is what fraction of the time are we delivering real data to the destination. Did I get it right? 3 by 90 times 510 down the bottom, 52.9%. So with this sliding window protocol, with a window of 3, using this link, under these conditions, we get a, an efficiency of 52.9%. quickly calculate what would you get if you use stop and wait. Okay, spend a couple of minutes. Assume you use stop and wait flow control in this case. Same conditions. You don't have to draw the picture. You should be able to quickly calculate what's the efficiency if we instead use stop and wait. Try. Not sliding window with a window of three, but just stop and wait, which really is a window of one. Stop and wait. Remember, it would look like send a frame, do not send the next two, but just send one frame, get an act back, send the next frame, get an act back. What's the efficiency in that case? Anyone have an answer? Stop and wait. One frame, wait for the ACK. What fraction of the time are we sending real data? 17 sounds about right. 17%. See if you can arrive at that. About 18%, yep, 17, 18%. Just a, a bit more time for others to see if they can get that answer. So stop and wait. In fact, you'll see the same timing, but just remove these two frames. You don't have to draw it, but that's the concept. And from there, you can calculate how much time do we spend sending data every X time units. With stop and wait, we see, so imagine one and two would disappear. We'd see that one frame, ack, one frame, ack, and keep going forever. And the timing would be the same. That is, the time to receive the ack back takes 510 time units. Same as with a sliding window, because the link characteristics are the same, the data rates are the same. And we're only delivering one data frame in that time. And each data frame, so with sliding window, we delivered three data frames in that time. With stop and wait, just one data frame. And each data frame, we spend 90 time units transmitting real data. Nothing works. Right. Ninety time units spent sending real data, and you do the calculation, and it's in fact one third of this case, which is what seventeen, eighteen percent, seventeen point something. 
It's three times worse than our sliding window case. And recall that stop and wait is just a special case for sliding window. The window is one. If we set the window to one, we get stop and wait for sliding window. Because if the window is one, it means we can send one frame and then wait for an act. With a window th of three, we can send three frames, wait for an act. So stop and wait in this case is three times worse in terms of efficiency than our sliding window mechanism. The advantage of stop and wait is that it's very simple. The source and destination do not need to keep track of all these variables of what we've sent, what we're expecting to receive, the window size, because there's just one frame involved, each exchange. Also, the amount of memory or buffer space needed at the destination is at least the size of the maximum window. So with stop and wait, the window is one. We need buffer to store one frame at the destination, at least. With our sliding window, with three frames, B needs buffer space or memory to store at least three frames. We need more memory. Okay, one, thra one frame versus three frames is not much difference in terms of memory, but in practice, at least in older devices and or very cheap or low cost, uh, cheap or uh, small devices where memory is limited, uh, then it can be a significant difference in cost in, in, in processing if we need much more memory at the receiver. So the advantage of sliding window here is efficiency. The disadvantage of sliding window is that it's more complex and you need more memory at the receiver. Next page. Same scenario, same setup, except we've increased the window up, a, up to seven. We have a three-bit sequence number. So effectively stop and wait. The window is one. The previous case we calculated for a window of three. This one was a window of three. Now let's change the window again up to seven. So a three-bit sequence number. And you can go through and see what happens. Initially, is it shown? At the start, A is allowed to send seven frames. B must have buffer to store at least seven frames. We send one frame, so we, we start sending those seven frames, zero, one, two, and so on. After sending the first frame, we are allowed to send six more, so we send frame one, frame two, frame three, frame four. After sending frame three, we've sent zero, one, two, and three. We're allowed to, still allowed to send three more frames. You see, if you the size of the red and the green parts is always seven in this case. Now, if you look at the timing, and I recall I made a mistake in one of these numbers, we'll see that later. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, at time 500, we've finished transmitting four, we start transmitting five. We're allowed to send five, so we start sending frame five. Then at time 510, we receive the first act back. Because the act for frame zero with act number one eventually arrives back. So after, at least after starting transmitting five, zero to five would be outstanding. But then we receive the act back meaning zero is done. Zero has been successfully delivered, which allows us to send one more. Every time one frame is act, we're allowed to send one more frame. So when this act comes back, we're allowed to send also frame seven, six and seven. 
we transmit five, we start transmitting six, and while transmitting six, the next act comes back. And allowing us to send one more frame, frame zero in this case. Because zero and one are acknowledged, there's some outstanding, and we're allowed to send two more in this case. And we'll see, we transmit a frame, and then an act comes back for one of the previous frames. Every time an act comes back, we're allowed to send one more, so we transmit one, but then another act comes back, allowing us to send another one. We transmit, another act comes back. Send, receive act. Send, receive an act. We keep doing that forever. We've always got some frames which we're allowed to send. That as our window, the green part, is always open. There's always some frames in the window, meaning we're always allowed to send more frames. And because we keep receiving acts for the previous ones, we just continually, continuously send data frames. There's no time waiting for an act because the window is large enough such that uh, we spend all the time transmitting while we're waiting for that act. No time waiting. Always transmitting. So this is the best efficiency that we can get. We cannot do better than this. 100% of the time transmitting in this case. The only overhead is the header inside each data frame. Although we're always transmitting data frames, each data frame, this is with a window of seven, always transmitting, so we won't calculate here, always sending data, always receiving data, but of that data, there's 90 of real data and 10 of header. That was in the start, up of the, the start of the question. So 90% of the time we're transmitting real data. 100% of the time we're sending data frames. 90% of the time we're sending real data. Our efficiency is therefore 90%. And that's the best we can do in this case. So we've achieved maximum efficiency under these conditions. We're using the link all the time to send our data. The only overhead is the headers. The only way to improve the efficiency to go above 90 is to reduce the size of the headers or increase the size of the data inside the frame. But usually that's controlled or fixed. Any questions on how we calculate the efficiency in this case. We don't look at the total time for to get an act back because it turns out we're always sending. So we simply look at, if we're always sending, we look at the amount of header that we spend sending. So 90 of real, 10 of header, 90% efficient. 90% of the time sending real data. And just to remind you, that come from the setup of the question. At the start, we said each data frame takes is 90% time sending data, 10% of the time sending, real, sending the header. If it was 80-20, then we'd be 80% efficient. If it was 95-5, we'd be 95% efficient. So we see, by changing the window size, we improve our efficiency up to some maximum. What's our efficiency if the window is 15? Four bits. What's our efficiency? If the window is 15, increased more, how efficient will we, will we be in this case? 90. We cannot go better than 90. Good. We, we cannot send any faster than what we're doing now. So increasing the window further doesn't help in terms of efficiency. It, in fact, it just adds um, 
an extra size in the header for the for the sequence number to be included. So there's some optimal value for the window in this case, and seven in this case. Uh, in fact, you may find it slightly different than seven. I've used window sizes which are um, when we have a, a, a k-bit sequence number. I've taken window sizes the two, two to the k minus one. In practice, you could use different window sizes, ten, nine. Uh, it's just common to have a maximum window size which depends upon the sequence number. Did anyone see the error in this picture? What's the problem? The uh, five tens correct. The seven hundreds incorrect. I think it should be eight hundred there. I, I, I don't know why I even included it. It's not so relevant. But you can check. This would be five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred, and so on. So this should be eight hundred at that point. I think. But it doesn't impact upon our uh, our calculation. Efficiency ninety percent. The only overhead is the header the best we can do. Let's go back to our slides, summarize, and, and then we'll have a break. So, in general, with sliding window, the window controls how much we can send so that we don't overflow the receiver. And it depends. So what we actually send depends upon how much data we have available and when the acts come back. So we have one example we went through here. The example we went through just a moment ago and calculated the efficiency, that was for a case when we always had data to send. So when we always have something to send and there's always acts coming back, we calculated the efficiency. That's the maximum efficiency we can achieve. Of course, in some cases, in re reality, we may not have data to send. And, and uh, if there's no data to send, of course, we do not send anything. And the, the overall efficiency will go down. So if you want to calculate the efficiency that we can achieve with this sliding window protocol, then make the assumption that we've always got some data to send. This is the, the two examples we went through. So this is the setup for that question, except I just put some numbers in. So I think if you do the calculations, you'll see that the data is 90%, the header is 10%, the ACK frame is 10% or 10 units, and the propagation is 200 units. So it, with these numbers, you get the, the example we just went through with a 2-bit sequence number and a 3-bit sequence number. Let's just finish with a couple of extra uh, features. So both stop and wait, sliding window, send data, wait for an ACK. How much data do we send depends upon the window. <clears throat> there are a few more additional features, optional extras that you can use with sliding window. There's an optional receive not ready frame. That is the receiver when it receives data may send back an ACK but includes a number in there indicating don't send me any more data yet. So it doesn't allow the sender to send more data frames. And the way to do that is simply to set the ACK number to be the same as what was sent in the past. So there's this optional value, uh, optional frame type. And it comes important when we do this other thing called piggybacking. In the examples we've looked at, we've only considered data going from A to B. In a real link, there's usually data going from A to B and data going from B to A, okay, in both directions. In that case, we would use separate instances of the sliding window or stop and wait protocol. 
So A would keep track of what it's sending to B, and separately B would keep track of what it's sending to A. So we'd have data going from A to B, acts coming back, and then the other direction, data going from B to A and acts coming back. In that case, piggybacking is the concept that to save in how much we send, we can combine the data and the acts into one frame. Just quickly what that looks like. So here's an example where A sends data to B, B sends back an ACK, and then B sends some data to A, and A sends back an ACK. Okay, that, that may be a scenario that arises. Piggybacking is when we want to send data like that, but what we do, A sends some data to B, B sends back an ACK for that data, but in fact includes that ACK in the same frame as the data. So instead of sending two frames, ACK and then data, send just one frame, which contains the information of the ACK as well as the data that B wants to send to A. This is the concept of piggybacking. And it reduces the overhead a little bit, because if we used our numbers, the ACK was, say, 10 time units, the data was one, 100 which in included 90 plus 10 of header. Normally, the header, we can include all the information of the ACK. So if the header is designed in such a way that we don't need extra information for the ACK, we include the ACK number inside the header of the data. So when we combine them, we actually send for just 100. Instead of sending for 10 plus 100, we send for just 100 giving a small reduction in how much time we spend sending. So that's the concept of piggybacking. And it's common in, in protocols. Combine the data and ACK uh, into one frame. What's the last two points? If no data to send... OK, that's related to piggybacking. If, if we don't have data to send, like A in the third case doesn't have any more data to send to B, just send a normal ACK. If there's no new ACK, that is if we send data and then send, <coughs> excuse me, send data back, if there's no ACK to send back, then we can include the old ACK number, which uh, is combined with piggybacking. I think we don't need to understand that at this stage. In later protocols, we may see examples of that. So main point here, piggybacking is the concept of combining a data and an act frame into one frame. And finishes for flow control, the two main mechanisms, stop and wait and sliding window. The next thing is error control. What happens when we lose data? And we'll see that, well, we retransmit. We send our data. If it doesn't arrive at the destination, if we don't receive an act back, then resend the data that we sent previously as a, as a way to uh, fix errors, to fix the, the loss of data. Let's stop now and have a break. And at 10.40, we'll have not a lecture, but, uh, well, let's say a, a tutorial. <laughs>